Our lesson today is uh, we're continuing our study of the Lord's Supper, and when you study the Lord's Supper, you're studying about the cross, of course. And so this is our fourth lesson uh, concerning the, the Lord's Supper. And our texts are from 1 Corinthians chapter um, 11, verse 26, and then also Matthew 26 and Luke chapter um, and Luke chapter 22. We'll read those passages. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And then in Matthew 26, I will not drink it from this, I will not drink from this fruit of the vine from now on until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. And then in Luke 22, Jesus said, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you. And then we want to talk about this uh, desire to eat this uh, future meal with him. And so we go to Revelation 19, verse 8. And uh, this is one of the passages that talks about the wedding supper of the Lamb. That's what I want to talk about today. Blessed are those who are invited to eat the wedding supper of the Lamb. So when we eat the uh, Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day, what, what are we proclaiming? Well, we're proclaiming, it says here, the Lord's death. And how long are we to proclaim the Lord's death? Well, it says here, until he comes. We're going to continue to proclaim the Lord's death every Sunday until he comes or until we die. What's the assumption of these statements? Well, the assumption that underlines our participation of the, of the Lord's Supper is he's coming. He's coming back. We're expressing our faith when we eat the Lord's Supper that Jesus is returning. And you can say, but you do this every Sunday. You do it every Lord's Day. And as I said, yes, and we are going to keep participating in the Lord's Supper until he comes or until we die. There are two authorizations of, or um, dramas, authorized dramas, uh, that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, uh, it uh, proclaims and God has given to the church. And the two are baptism and the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper is a proclamation to every believer and to others who see believers, each believer partake of the Lord's Supper, about the good news concerning Jesus Christ and his death on the cross. It's a visual sermon. It's a proclamation we, we see in these readings here. Jesus said, you proclaim, or, or Paul did, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. It's a proclamation of what? The good news about Jesus and what he's done for us on the cross. It's like the audible preaching of the, of the good news about Jesus Christ and the cross. Uh, the Lord's Supper is intended to nourish us and strengthen our faith right now as we partake of it. And so um, every Lord's Day, this is a drama and we reenact this drama of our Lord's work on the cross. The cross is pictured throughout the Lord's Supper. And uh, we do it, uh, and we proclaim it. We continue to proclaim it. And the reason we do this is not only to strengthen our faith, but it's because the gospel, the good news about Jesus and his work on the cross, is an eternal gospel. Um, the Bible tells us in Revelation, John says, Then I saw another angel flying in midair, and he had the eternal good news about Jesus to proclaim to those who live on earth, to every nation, tribe, language, and people. So why would we do this over and over again? Why would we reenact every single Lord's Day, go through this play, this drama about Jesus Christ, uh, and his death on the cross. We're already believers. We already believe the good news that Jesus died on the cross for our sins. And some people might think, well, you need to go on now to deeper things. Don't go over this every single Lord's Day. 
but the Lord gives it to us and we reenact it over and over again. The same play, you might say, every Lord's Day. And the, the writer of Hebrew gives the reason uh, for this. He, he says, consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We do it every Lord's Day to strengthen our faith. Now, our Lord's statements in these passages that we read should deeply affect us. Do you know what our Lord is saying when he says uh, these things? He, he's saying that he's looking forward to his coming, and he's looking forward to a time when he can sit down with us and, and uh, feast with us at the wedding supper of the Lamb. And yet very few believers, I believe, link the Lord's Supper with the end of the world. And that's what Jesus is doing here. There is a direct connection between the Lord's Supper and the end of the world, the wedding supper of the Lamb that we read about in the book of Revelation that we want to talk about a little bit. This is, what, this is why the writer of Hebrews said about the cross that for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. He was looking forward. He endured that cross, that horrible, dreadful cross. He endured it with joy because he was looking forward. He was anticipating this great wedding supper of the Lamb. So this wedding supper that we're going to talk about a little bit, that the Lord's Supper looks forward to, Jesus is going to sit down with all of his people. Abraham will be there. Isaac will be there, Jacob will be there. All of these uh, dignitaries, all of these saved people, great people like Daniel, the Apostle Paul, all of the apostles, they're going to be there. And, and all of us who are believers are going to be there. And we're going to sit down and we're going to feast with our Lord at this wedding supper of the Lamb. This is what John wrote in John in Revelation chapter 18. He said, then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory for the wedding of the lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. So those of us who are believers, we're going to sit down and we're going to eat at this great feast. There's going to be great rejoicing. And we will physically see Jesus face to face. All of our sorrow, every tear is going to be wiped away from our eyes. And we will serve him forever in a new heavens and, and, uh, and the new earth. So we look forward to this. Believers, when we participate in the Lord's Supper, we're looking forward to this day, you see. And Jesus himself is looking forward to this day. Now, I want to say just a little bit about the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, you know, it's always seemed remote to me. I confess that I have avoided it most of my life, as I also did most of my life, the book of Romans and Galatians as well, because um, I never really understood uh, that we're saved by grace and how that we're saved by grace for the largest part of my life. I would have said, yes, we're saved by grace, but I really, and then I would have spent the rest of my time trying to prove that we're saved by works. And uh, so Romans and Galatians were just like trying to fit, you know, a round peg into a square hole and vice versa. I, they were impossible to understand with, you know, the kind of misunderstanding that I had of grace that we very seldom, by the way, taught about in the denomination that I grew up in. But I had a hard time. I had a hard time forcing my theology that I was uh, raised and soaked in myself with the teachings of Paul and Romans and Galatians on the one hand. But on the other hand, 
I wasn't sure that my denomination had the right interpretation of uh, Revelation as well. And I wasn't comfortable, and I'm still not comfortable, with many interpretations of Revelation today. I don't know a lot, but I do know one thing, that every single generation for 2,000 years has always looked to the events of their, their generation and said that the book of Revelation is fulfilling those events, and every generation was wrong. So, you know, I, I struggle with uh, the interpretation of a lot of things in Revelation. But, and, and a lot of it's very puzzling. You know, it's, it's uh, almost bizarre. In fact, it is bizarre. Page after page is bizarre, and there's frightening images. Um, there's wars, there's plagues, there's beasts, there's angels, there's rivers of blood, there's, you know, demonic frogs, there's a seven-headed dragon, there is, um, you know, just all kinds of bizarre things like that. I, when we were, when I was, um, when we had a younger family and my family was at home, one thing I found out about, though, is that my boys, one boy especially, I remember, he was just fascinated. We would read a chapter a, a day in the Bible, and when we would get to Revelation, those chapters are pretty short. He would want to read more. He didn't want to stop. So as mystifying as the book of Revelation is, and everyone will have to admit that it is in many ways mystifying, there's one thing that everybody agrees on. I want to tell you something. Everybody, I've never heard anybody even try to disagree with what I'm about to say about Revelation. It is soaked in worship. It is soaked in worship, and nobody disagrees with that. And one phrase that you will read repeatedly in this book is this phrase, the Lamb of God. You see, we're going to sit down at a wedding, a great wedding supper, and we're, and we're going to sit down with the Lamb of God. Now, this phrase, Lamb of God, doesn't surprise any one of us. All of us who are listening live here, anybody who will listen later, if you've had any connection at all with religion or Christianity, at least a Christian form of religion, you're not surprised with this phrase, Lamb of God. We frequently sing about the Lamb of God. When I went to the internet to look up some things, which I frequently do when I'm getting a lesson together, I check things out sometimes, I, I typed in songs with the theme, Lamb of God, and immediately I was given a link that said 1,000 and almost 400 songs, and they gave a list. I only went, you know, through the first column, but they had gave a list of 1,000, almost 400 uh, Christian hymns and songs that the theme of those songs is Lamb of God. And many of them, you and I would know very well, they gave, uh, listed the old rugged cross, you're my all in all, and then were uh, those with uh, the title in it, worthy is the lamb, crown him with many crowns. You're washed in the blood. We will glorify um, just as I am, redeemed. There are many, many others. You, you can look on the internet yourself. So what I'm trying to show you is those of us who have grown up around Christianity, we're not surprised with this theme. We, we sing it. We've been sing Some of us have heard songs that include the theme, Lamb of God, since our birth. When we were in our mother's womb, we were hearing these songs. And so there's many other songs as well uh, that I didn't know that are entitled, uh, like The Lamb Who Set Me Free and uh, Worship the Lamb of God. And there's songs that they had on there that I didn't know those songs. But they listed almost 1,400 songs that the theme was the Lamb of God. So what I'm saying is, uh, for Jesus to be called the Lamb of God is not news to us, most of us. And probably none of us who are alive, it's not news to us at all. We're used to Jesus being called the Lamb of God. Jesus is many things. He is, <clears throat> and let me show you, um, these are some of the things that Jesus is. He is called Lord. Jesus is Lord. Whether people accept his lordship or not, he's Lord. 
And a Lord is a very important person, as you can see right there. He's the, but he's the Lord of all lords. And people bow down to lords. They're that important. But he is, of all the lords who have ever lived, Jesus is the Lord of all the lords. And then we have Jesus being the king of kings. Well, as you can see, you know, kings are very important. But of all the kings who've ever lived, Jesus is the king, we say, of kings. And then Jesus is God. I don't have to say anything about that. He, that's another name for Jesus, God. Jesus is Messiah. Now, Messiah is a leader, a leader of a group, a leader of a cause. Jesus in the Old Testament is referred to as Messiah. And Jesus is high priest. Now, you, you don't get any more important than high priest. I know you think maybe king is more important, but if you're a spiritual godly person, you realize that a high priest of God, I mean, they were your direct connection to God himself. And there was no higher, more dignified office than high priest. Well, Jesus is high priest. And then you look at this last row, Jesus is savior. And we've all called Jesus our savior. And I hope that every one of us who's listening live, and I hope everyone in the world, that he is your Savior. And Jesus is called the Lamb of God. And Jesus is prophet. Now, a prophet's a preacher like me. And preachers are very important. I know people don't think so, but they are. We are. We're speaking the very words of God. We have a very serious responsibility. People may not respect us at all, but I'm telling you, we are very, we are to be honored. We're a dignified group of people. And so you have all of these things. You look at this list again from left to right on the top first. Lord, Jesus is the Lord of all lords. He's the king of all the kings. He is God. He is Messiah. He is high priest he is our savior he's the lamb of god and he's prophet now one of those is not like the others can you see that one of those is not like the others these are titles of dignity they're titles of power they're titles of status but lamb, not even sheep, by the way. A lamb is a little bitty sheep. One of them is not like the others, and it's almost comical for Jesus to be called the Lamb of God. I want you to think about it. From birth, as I said, we have been referring to Jesus. We've been singing songs and you'll hear preachers and people talk about Jesus as the Lamb of God. But I want you to try this. You won't be able to do it, but I want you to try something. I want you to try to imagine that you're not familiar with 2,000 years of us caught Christians calling Jesus the Lamb of God. Imagine you've never heard this. Imagine you have never heard a song that is sung about Jesus being the Lamb of God. You've never heard him called that by anybody. You've never even heard him compared to a lamb, much less say that he is the lamb of God. Well, I'm telling you, if that's the case, that title seems comical alongside those other titles of Jesus. Are you kidding me? Your leader, you call him the lamb, a lamb? Now, we can easily imagine Jesus as king. You know, he's the lion of Judah. And kings are, I mean, lions are kingly. You know, they're king of the jungle. Nobody messes with them. And if you ever go into a jungle and you see them, they're not afraid of anything. They're not afraid of anybody else either. They are literally the king of the jungle. In fact, when John, in the book of Revelation, first sees the lamb, He's actually looking for a lion. He's looking for the lion of Judah. 
And yet the Lion of Judah only makes a cameo appearance in the book of Revelation. Meanwhile, the Lamb dominates the book of Revelation, appearing almost 30 times. The Lamb, you, we, we read, it, it rules in heaven. The, the Lamb, we read in the book of Revelation, leads hundreds of thousands of men and angels into battle and strikes fear into the hearts of wicked people. John, as I said, looks for a lion. He's looking for the lion of Judah, but instead what he sees is a lamb. Look at our passages there. Chapter 5, verse 6, as though it had been slain. A lamb, this next passage, worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals. He says, for you are worthy, and by your blood you ransom men for, for God. Heaven and earth give glory to Jesus Christ as God, to him who sits on the throne, and to the Lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the elders fell down and worshiped, chapter 5. You know, other the, the Old Testament does compare Jesus to a Lamb, Isaiah 53. And the New Testament does as well. Um, um, when um, really through Isaiah 53 in Acts chapter 8, when Philip is preaching. And then Peter compares him to a lamb as well in his in 1 Peter chapter 1. But John is the only one in his writings who says he is the lamb. You remember at the very beginning of John's gospel, he quotes John the Baptist as saying, uh, that Jesus, when he identifies Jesus, he's the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. John doesn't just compare him to a lamb. He says he is the Lamb of God. And this Lamb, now Jesus in, in the book of Revelation is a ruler. In fact, he's robed as, a high, uh, as a, um, a high priest. He is the first and the last. He's the Holy One. He's the Lord of all lords in Revelation. He is the King of all kings. In the book of Revelation, all of those things are true. But overwhelmingly, Jesus is the Lamb of God. He is a Lamb. Now, lambs, now sheep are very defenseless uh, animals themselves. They're very uh, docile. And, but lambs are little bitty sheep. And uh, even children can uh, control a little bitty lamb. You look at that picture of that lamb right there. I have a one-year-old grandson. He's one year and nine months. I believe that he could control a little lamb like that. Jesus wasn't even a sheep in, in John's revelation. He was a lamb, a little lamb. Now, we could spend a lot of time talking about who the Lamb of God is, what the Lamb of God is, why we call him Lamb, and all of it would be helpful in helping to encourage us and enlighten us on the Lord's Supper and reveal things about the Lord's Supper that would help us in our participation every Lord's Day. We could study um, much about what God reveals to us about the sacrifice of lambs from the beginning of history. And we could say a lot of things like that, preach many lessons on this, but this is the bottom line. The Passover is a type of the Lord's Supper. And in the Passover, they sacrificed a lamb. You see that lamb? That's what they sacrificed. It was a lamb, not a sheep, a lamb. And on top of that, the high priest could only enter the Holy of Holies one time a year. And in the Lord's Supper, which is a picture of Jesus' death on the cross, Jesus saw himself as both high priest and the victim lamb. But, you know, the question is, really, why did Jesus have to be a lamb? Why not be a stallion? Why, why not be a tiger? Why not be a bull? Why not be a lion, like we said? But Revelation sees him as a lamb, and look at the, our passage over there and, and other places in Revelation as well, uh, standing as if slain. I want to tell you why, and it's very brief explanation, obviously, but it's because only a sacrificial lamb uh, fits this divine picture. 
in all these sacrifices from the beginning of time, and of which the Passover itself is a pattern for our salvation. Only this lamb fits this picture and this divine pattern perfectly. And so we read many things in the book of Revelation. Look at, look at all these things that we, we see in the book of Revelation. Um, as we said, John the Baptist, at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, I, identifies him as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Revelation 22 and Revelation 21 uh, talk about the throne of God and the Lamb will be there in heaven. The lamb is going to be there. And we in Revelation 21, the lamb's book of life, we read about the lamb's book of life. Uh, Revelation 21 again, the glory of God illuminates the city, this new Jer heavenly Jerusalem, and the lamb is its light. God and the lamb are the light of this new Jerusalem. In chapter 21 again, uh, John said, I saw no temple in the city, this heavenly city, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. So they're the light and they are the temple. And again, chapter 21, come with me, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. Chapter 7, for the Lamb on the throne will be their shepherd. Now that's really interesting to me. You know, um, sheep and lambs need shepherds. We don't say that they are shepherds, but here the lamb that's on the throne will be our shepherd and he will lead them. That's what shepherds do. They lead, they lead sheep. Shepherds lead sheep. He will lead them to springs of living water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And then in chapter 19, the time has come for the wedding feast of the lamb. That's what we're looking forward to right there. All right. So ordinarily, I don't uh, have songs in the middle of the lesson, but today I want to because, you know, if you're like me, I, I do better when I have just studied something and then I sing a song that has words about the land. So I want to uh, sing a song now. And about the Lamb of God. With all the, you know, we haven't said much about the Lamb of God, but we've said it enough, hopefully, that maybe this song that we sing together will, will help us. And let me try to get it going here. Okay. You have Think on your side to walk upon his hands and to be on the lamb of the Lord. Oh, 
All right, that's a beautiful song, and I hope that it was more meaningful um, and maybe helped you in your singing of it after we said a few things about the Lamb of God. So Jesus was high priest, and um, he is also he was also the victim uh, lamb. And as high priest, he could do what no other high priest could do. You remember all the other high priests entered the holy uh, place only one time. Only one, the high priest entered only one time a year. But it, remember, it wasn't with his own blood. And as I said earlier, he only stayed for a short time because his unworthiness drove him out. But Jesus entered the Holy of Holies into heaven itself once for all. He made an offering uh, of himself as our sacrifice. And so he was the high priest and he was the victim lamb. And what is more, by Jesus' death, we too are made a kingdom of priests. We are... Uh, the church of the firstborn. Uh, we are the, um, the, um, the church of the firstborn and a kingdom of priests. And so we're invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb itself in heaven itself someday. What will this celebration be like, by the way? Well, at the birth of Jesus, there was a, um, there was a song that, Jesus, that people sang. Now, there's a lot of singing that goes on in heaven. There's a lot of worship that goes on in heaven. But uh, listen to one of the songs that the angels sang when Jesus came to this earth and when he was born. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth peace to those upon his, whom his favor rests. And uh, this is echoed in, um, in uh, the great song of Moses in Revelation chapter 15. We read, and the angels and the host sang the song of God's servant Moses and the Lamb. Great and marvelous are your deeds, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, uh, King of the nations. Who will not fear you, Lord, and bring glory to your name? For you alone are holy. All nations will come uh, and worship before you, for your righteous acts have been revealed. And we sing that song that the angel and believers sing before the throne. In Revelation chapter 4, verse 8, each of the four living creatures had six wings and was covered with eyes all around under its wings. Day and night, they never stopped saying, listen to this, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. And this is the same thing actually as isaiah saw in his um heaven uh revelation as well in isaiah chapter 6 he said and they were calling these same angels uh that had these six wings he said they were calling to one another holy 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 is the lord almighty the whole earth is full of his glory <clears throat> so i ask you uh today um why is jesus looking forward to this day why is he looking forward to this great feast this great wedding supper of the lamb you know who am i that he would look forward to sitting down with me and he would endure the cross with joy 
And he looks forward to that day when he will drink it anew with me in his kingdom. It's amazing that he's looking forward to that day. And Jesus is inviting all of us to this supper. In Revelation chapter 3, Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, anyone. He said, I will come into him and eat with him. And he with me. Jesus wants to eat with us. It's amazing. And then look at this passage on, on the right. Then I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and like loud peals of thunder shouting, Hallelujah, for our Lord God Almighty reigns. That's one reason I chose that song today. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. Then the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. When John uh, enters the spirit 